Hello and welcome to my full bookshelf. My name is Federica and today we're doing a video about the International Booker Prize shortlist. The shortlist is going to be announced as you watch this video probably in just a few hours, less than 24 hours for sure. The reason why I'm making this video is because last year I made one trying to predict who was going to be the winner of the 2020 International Booker Prize and I got that prediction right. But most importantly, more important than the prediction itself was the experience of reading the books on the shortlist. Last year I had an amazing time just reading all the books that were shortlisted for the award. I decided to do the same thing this year. I decided to read all the books that were shortlisted for the award, try to discuss them all uh, in as much detail as possible without giving away any substantial part of the plot that would ruin the experience of somebody who has not read them before, and at the same time try and make an educated prediction as to who could potentially be the winner this year. Before we delve into the six books that are on the shortlist this year, for those who don't know, the International Booker Prize is an international prize awarded in the UK to a work of fiction that has been translated from a foreign language into English and published in the UK. Uh, it's an annual award. I believe every year there are six books on the shortlist, but I could be wrong in terms of how many titles are usually on the shortlist. The key thing about the International Booker Prize is the work of the translator that is equal to the work of the author. In fact, you will see um, there is a prize for the winning title of £50,000 and this prize is split equally, so 25 and 25, between the author and the translator. This year there are six books on the short list and I've got some key facts about the short list this year. So there is a total of six shortlisted titles um, published by five different imprints in four different languages and they're judged by a panel of five experts which include authors, a professor, a poet and a historian slash author. On this year's shortlist we have At Night All Blood is Black by David Diop, translated from the French by Anna Moskova Moskovakis. After this we have The Dangers of Smoking in Bed by Mariana Enriquez, translated from the Spanish by Mega McDowell. When We Cease to Understand the Word by Benjamin Labatou, translated from the Spanish by Adrian Nathan West. Then we have The Employees, a workplace novel of the 22nd century by Olga Ram, translated from the Danish by Martin Eitken. Next up we have A Memory of Memory by Maria Stepanova, translated from the Russian by Sasha Dagdale. And finally, the final title is The War of the Poor by Eric Roulard, translated from the French by Marc Polizotti. So these are the six books that are currently on the shortlist and I'm going to be discussing them one by one. So the first book that we have on the shortlist for the International Booker Prize 2021 is At Night All Blood is Black by David Diop and translated from the French by Anna Moshovakis. Published by Pushkin Press. In total, this book has 145 pages, so as you can see, it's quite short, and this is classified as historical fiction. Uh, it's classified as historical fiction because the story takes place during the Second World War. Uh, the main character is called Alpha and is this young Senegalese man. Um, I believe when we start the story, he's 20. Alpha is from Senegal and he decides, together with his friend Mademba, to join the French forces during the war and he's sent to the Western Front to fight. During the, the initial chapters of the book we understand that Alpha's, and that's the way he described his friends more than brother, Mademba, uh, is dead. One other thing that we know at the very beginning of the story is that Alpha has done something that isn't quite right, although at this very stage we cannot um, quite understand what it is. In terms of time frame, is very jumpy, it goes back and forth between the past in Senegal and the present. We, as I said, we follow Alpha and his sort of emotional journey from this moment when he realizes something that he has done is not quite right to accepting that his life has basically forever changed without giving anything away. Um, this is something that obviously has to do a lot with the consequences conflict has on people but also it is something that it really reflects probably what was at the time 
and potentially still is this big issue of racism. The book certainly deals with the consequences of colonialism and people in these countries that are potentially left um, with not even identity crisis but almost idolizing this foreign country where they don't get necessarily treated the way they should. Uh, there is the issue of race and racial discrimination highlighted here and there throughout this book. Uh, there are some passages um, that highlight, I decided to highlight um, where some strong terms are used. Um, I think especially the, the physical characteristics are often used to, to show how people in Europe, you know, the classic white European person could be terrified or intimidated or discriminate against somebody who is clearly black and coming from a country that is in Africa. So has a different physique, has different uh, facial features, has different body features, has different skin colour. Other than race discrimination and colonialism that are glanced upon in this book, I think the key topic is PTSD and the relationship with sort of like the um, extreme situations that people faced during the First World War, the guilt and the loss of the self and the mind. So I think um, this is a key, these are the key topics that we're discussing in this book. As I said, it's very short and we just follow Alpha and discover a little bit more about what happened to Madimba. Next up on the shortlist we have The Dangers of Smoking in Bed uh, by uh, Mariana Enriquez, translated from the Spanish by Mega McDowell. This is a collection of short stories that can be described as horror slash herb, I've written this down, urban realism. Um, all the story, well almost all the stories are set in Argentina which is where the author is from but uh, one or two of them, if I'm not wrong, at set in Spain as well. Uh, it's a very sort of Spanish-speaking environment, the one where we see all the various characters and the stories that are not intertwined one with another. We do have this very strong sense of urban uh, within the book. Urban centre, urban lifestyle, the change from rural, rural to urban and that is sort of like the connecting thread between the stories. As I said, they, they, they have nothing to do with one another. They have quite a lot to do with the perception of the foreign environment with the individual. And um, it is very, it, it was really pleasant experience to read this book because each story was, um, it's almost, it, almost every story started just as a normal story and you wouldn't quite believe it would then turn into something almost horrific. Um, there is a sense of unease that follows you from the first line until the last line that is quite um, quite good in a way. I, I feel like not many books uh, that want to achieve this manage to actually achieve it and it has that sort of feeling of books that were written in the past centuries that um, you know that almost gothic feel deeply connected to places um, that the author was able to translate into a modern 21st century sort of environment. So I really appreciate that and I really appreciate the fact that she was able to do something classic like write a ghost story or a horror story or an unsettling story um, and translate that into something that would be applicable, applicable to the 21st century. And obviously if you believe in ghosts or you don't believe in ghosts, they're not all ghost stories. They, there are some stories about cannibalism, for instance. It also touches in some stories the concept of family and history, family history, um, what is real and what is fictional, and the, cont the contact with the other word, such as, you know, we live in a city and we're so busy living in a city that sometimes we don't take it in. As I mentioned, this, the concept of city that sort of swallows the inhabitants is the key concept of the book. Uh, also in stories where the city is not necessarily at the centre of the story, um, there is a concept of modern life, which is often connected to the concept of city. And I think that's what the author wanted to achieve. Next book that we have on the shortlist is When We Seek to Understand a Word by Benjamin Labatou, translated from the Spanish by, I always forget, Adrian Nathan West. 
This can also be classified very much like the other Pushkin Press uh, book as a historical novel. Now, it, it is historical because it deals with events from the past, mostly from the 19th, sorry, 20th century, um, especially when it comes to the scientific field. Um, can it be classified as a novel? I'm not sure. It, it feels more like reading short stories that are interconnected to one another because we usually towards the end of each segment uh, you're introduced to a concept or character that you will then see in the following one or later on in the book. This being said, uh, it's based on historical events uh, that follow uh, key scientific um, thinkers and experts, especially in the field of mathematics and physics, that were incredibly important for the development of technology, humankind, and also not necessarily good things that happened during the 20th century. So for instance, we see Einstein, we see Schrodinger, we see Grotendieck, and so on. It's as if this book takes you on a journey from idea to concept to prototype, to physical object or discovery. It may sound intimidating to people who have not um, studied physics or mathematics or science, but while there are some concepts that are discussed here, they are not... Um, the, you don't go in depth into the scientific concept, you look more at the figure of the person that was behind the idea, behind the discovery, behind the formula. So one common thread that we see is that most of the stories have to do with um, Germany and the Nazis or the Second World War and the aftermath of that, uh, potentially the beginning of the Cold War. The key theme for me was very, very clear since page one and the key theme is the good, the bad and the ugly of science. Science as something that empowers you, but something that could also destroy you. Science as something that needs to be valued and cherished and discovered, but also something that cannot, should not be abused, but often is. And throughout this book you read um, stories of these characters. It starts with the first story that apparently, according to the notes at the end of the book, uh, only has one para paragraph that is fictional uh, up until the end where you can sense obviously there is more um, y You can sense the hand of the writer the author um, Much more and there is much more romanticism. Let's say around some of the stories. It reads almost as if it was um, a warning sign for what could happen if we keep repeating history so there is a lot of talk about uh, the issues of science used within the defence sphere. There is a lot of talk about nuclear and physics used to create something that may not necessarily benefit humankind, even though the concept itself is very pure, because mathematics is often really pure, it's just numbers, or physics is really pure. It's a book that really strikes a chord, that is quite modern as well, uh, something that makes you reflect and I feel like once you finish reading it you sort of want to stop for a moment and think about all the various events for as fictional as they can be but they all started with an idea that in the majority of cases, if not in all of the cases, um, they were not meant to lead to the consequences that they had in the current life. Next book is really tiny and um, it's by a publisher that I had never heard of before, it's called Lolly Editions. The book is The Employees, a workplace novel of the 22nd century, wrote, written in Danish by Olga Ram, Ravn and translated by Martin Eitken. This book is, as you can see, very tiny, but also something that most likely you've never read before. It can be classified as science fiction slash dystopian, I would say, slash futuristic, potentially. Um, it reads as a series of testimonies, so with the exception of the little introduction that there is, which is literally half a page, I don't know if you can see, and the final epilogue, which is again, I think half a page, or yeah, uh, you only read testimonies. 
or to be precise, statements. Statements can be as brief as one line or as long as multiple pages. Who gives the statements? Uh, the inhabitants of the 6,000 ship. Now, we don't know what the 6,000 ship is. What we think, um, what we grasp throughout the book, even though we don't really precisely know, even after we finish reading the book, uh, it, it sounds like it is a spaceship. And the spaceship is in space. And within the spaceship, there are some rooms that have objects from New Discovery, which is most likely a planet, which if we read between the lines, could very well be planet Earth. The inhabitants of 6,000 ships, a 6,000 ship are humans and humanoid. And the premise is that the people who live, the things, the inhabitants are those who were born and those who were made. So we've got humans and we've got humanoids, which are basically robots. Um, the statements are a collection of testimonies given to a panel. Uh, I don't think in person, I think through some sort of technology. And these testimonies basically look at how the inhabitants of the sp spaceship uh, relate to objects that are on board of the spaceship. We never know what the object is, we never know whether the statement is given by a humanoid or a human, because, uh, 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 with the exception of a few cases in which they mention them specifically. Um, so you're very much left to guess each time you, you start a new chapter whether you're reading from the human perspective or you're reading from the machine's perspective and also the objects, they, some of them sound really similar to what we have, some of them sound really abstract, so you do wonder whether the person, the thing given a statement is not human potentially because you've never seen something like grass for instance. You don't understand where the book is going until the very last few pages and then you understand why the series of statements is being given and where it is leading. The common thread throughout the book is the fact that each person or thing or machine that gives a statement is questioning a few aspects of life on 6,000 ship. First of all, what is life? What does it mean to exist? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a machine? Am I human? And who determines that? And what does it mean to be remote from everything and everyone? And but most importantly, what every single statement seems to concede is the concept of what is my purpose? Humans and machines alike wonder that and whether that's explicitly said or whether that's something that you read in between the lines, there is a sort of what is my purpose as the core of the book. Uh, it is a very, <laughs> it's a very unique experience to read this. Uh, there's a lot of sort of existentialism going on within each statement and is incredibly rare and unique to bump into a book like this. Um, and as I said, I've never read anything like this and while it is not one of my favourite books of all time, it's something that I've definitely already recommended to some people because I know they would absolutely love it. Um, but as somebody who has never really read science fiction beyond, you know, I don't know, I don't think I've ever read science fiction in general, this is this is quite something. It is not an easy read, uh, but it's very quick. It's 135 pages, I believe. The next book we're going to talk about is A Memory of Nem Memory by Marissa Panova, translated from the Russian by Sasha Dagdale. The book is the longest on the shortlist. It's about 500 pages, and it can it can be classified again as historical fiction. This is probably um, the one that I struggle the most to define. A work of fiction just because it is fiction in some parts is more like romanticizing history or romanticizing a family history um, but at the same time there is quite a lot of writing that resembles essays in a way. The incipit of the story is that the author Maria Stepanova who writes the book in first person throughout the 500 pages um, she, her aunt dies and as her aunt dies and she visits her house, flat, wherever, she sort of has to go through a lot of belongings um, of her aunt and those belongings uh, include notebooks, they include diaries, they include pictures, postcards and so on 
and through each and every single object that she encounters she wonders whether um, what the story is behind that and from there starts this physical and mnemonical journey of discovery of memory memory as something that can go alongside history but also memory as something that is incredibly different and separate from history the majority of the book is set in Germany, uh, sorry, in Russia, and there is also obviously the mention of Germany, the mention of France, the mention of Austria, because especially during the 20th century there was quite a lot of movement around those areas, and also it was much harder to define the borders up until after the Second World War. Through the collection of historical facts and going through historical documents, both of her family on the mother's side and the father's side, she is able to put together a sort of collage that is not necessarily very comprehensive but it is a collage of what happened to her sides of the family during the 20th century and i'm not just talking about the holocaust but also before that and after that so there is this concept of memory that is crucial to the whole narration memory um of the author as in i use my memory to rem remember something but also memory that was used by the various people mentioned in the book in order to create a physical tangible something to live to leave behind once they were no longer there um, there is also the exploration of other texts such as uh, other books speeches um, historical documents and this is the part that makes it a little bit harder for me to classify this book as a novel just because there is so much writing that resembles almost an essay. The key things are always memory and history, how they relate to one another, what are the difference between memory and history. There is also the discussion of post-memory which is really interesting which is something that I had not encountered before and I will definitely go and research more uh, but is very fascinating especially when it comes to specific points in time in history uh, where you do realize that memory is something that has to be preserved but at the same time it doesn't necessarily match with history um, and also there is this sort of introspective journey that the, the author who is also the main character basically goes through which is why is memory so important why do i feel like i have this duty to preserve memory and memory is it something that I need to preserve do I need to make it do I need to leave behind uh, there is mention of the concept of Jewishness the concept of the Holocaust and the concept of writing historical fiction while also writing history that the, the author has never lived through but just sort of lived through the consequences of that there is this um, thread of nostalgia that goes through that we can find in every single page almost and yeah it, it was a definitely an interesting read very touching at some points especially because it's quite raw in some parts as the author acknowledges her limits and also the fact that she she had she felt this sense of duty but also was a duty towards her family or towards herself to tell this story so that was quite interesting the last book on this year's International Book of Press shortlist was is The War of the Pool by Eric Villard, translated by, from the French by Marc Polizzotti. Uh, this is again a piece of historical fiction. It's incredibly short, 66 pages, and um, it it is set during the 16th century in Europe with particular focus on what we now call Germany. And the central character of the story is the real character of Thomas Munzer, uh, who was a German preacher. The key thing about Thomas Munzer was that he was different from other preachers and he went against what was preached by the Roman Catholic Church and went against at the same time during the 16th century what um, Martin Luther was advocating for. The title itself, I think, reveals quite a lot about the book. Um, one key element is the accessibility of religious texts to the masses. Not just as a physical text, because not that many people will be able to read, especially not Latin or German, um, but mostly the concepts within the Bible, for instance, and not needing the 
extra layer of the clergy in order to access information about the Bible, for instance. The whole book deals with class struggle, uh, poor against the aristocrats or the church, uh, the approach to religion and the accessibility, as I said, and the fact that this weird, strange character of Thomas Munzer had this um, detachment from both the Roman Catholic Church and Martin Luther, who was sort of more in line with what he was advocating for, but at the same time, not quite. And there is this very violent thread throughout the book. You see a lot of violence, you perceive a lot of violence in words, you perceive a lot of violence in acts. And I mean, um, if you know the story of Thomas Spencer, you also know that, and this is not without spoiling anything, uh, he doesn't do a happy ending. He doesn't have a happy ending. One of the other things that are discussed within this book is the importance of new technologies as something that is empowering and something that should give power not just to those who already have it but also power to those who never had it before and have an opportunity for the first time in order to change their class. The Protestant Reformation is the core of the book. Um, it does feel a little bit strange to pack all these things in just one main character and one extremely tiny book. I do have to say that while I was reading it I was feeling a bit... I, I felt the need for more pages. It would have given more to the reader as an experience um, with a few more pages. I felt like it wasn't going deep enough into the subject. Um, but yeah, if you want to read about 16th century Europe with a focus on the Protestant Reformation, with a focus on uh, the character of Thomas Munzer, um, definitely pick this up. As you can probably tell by how I am doing this sort of review kind of thing, I am uh, running a bit out of time. It's already um, the evening of the 1st of June, which means in about 24 hours you will know who the winner is. But I still wanted to give my two cents on this year's shortlist. Having read last year's shortlist, I was a bit disappointed to go into this book. I was expecting something that would be not as changing necessarily, but something I would want to go back to. And out of all these books, there are probably two, almost three books that I would reread in the future. Whereas last year, if you watched the video, you will know that some of those books are my favorites and still are, and I still recommend them to people and I will never get bored of talking about. What are the books that I actually preferred out of this? Um, so I think as somebody who um, generally enjoys science and mathematics and physics and so on, uh, when we cease to understand the word was a really interesting read. I think the sense of warning that is given by each part of the story about what could happen should we not take enough care to make discoveries that are indeed in line with good ideas or with good end goals um, was something really touching as somebody who's living through the 21st century. Um, to read about the dangers of weapons and to read about the dangers of potential discoveries that could obliterate humankind. The other title that I really really enjoyed and this is probably the only one that I would consult again um, in the future is In Memory of Memory. The reason why I think I enjoyed this book a lot is because I have deep respect for the concept of memory and um, I don't have a personal interest in the, in the Second World War, especially in Europe. I also have an interest as a writer who is writing a historical novel in understanding how other writers writing a historical novel based on real events on real families approach the subject. That being said, um, I also think this book needs to be praised for the translation work, which is something that I haven't discussed for the other books, but I think the translation work that went into this book is incredible. Now, I don't speak Russian, I haven't read the original Russian version, but I have read, at the very end of the book, there's a translator's note, which is just over a page long, and it explains just how much effort has gone into translating something that obviously is in a complete different language and where not everything can be literally translated into English to create this almost poetic kind of account of events and historical fiction. So if 
Um, if there are bonus points for translators doing a great job, uh, which I think probably all did because they're all on the shortlist for the International Booker Prize, I think um, in memory of memories translator Sh Sasha, Dug Dug Sasha Dugdale uh, did an incredible job and you can tell that it's something that required a lot of time, a lot of consultation with the author as well, a lot of um, precision in getting those details right. Coming now to the fun part. Who do I think will win? These are all the books that are on the shortlist and I think while all of them have positives and all of them were relatively enjoyable experiences, I think one is probably going to be the winner and I think that's going to be A Night All, Bo All Blood is Black by David Diop, translated from the French by, again I need to check this out, Anna Moshkova Moshovakis. As I mentioned, this book is a piece of historical fiction um, and it incorporates the um, experience of Senegalese soldiers during the, uh, during the First World War, World War on the Western Front. If we look at the book from a historical, a historical perspective and if we look at the book from the current perspective where we're at, um, we can see a lot of parallels in how the soldiers from Senegal were treated and how some classes and races are being treated right now. I think because of how actual it can still feel even though obviously we're not living during the First World War anymore and neither has the, the author lived through that because he's a, he was born in the 60s I believe, yeah 66. Um, I think a novel like this is probably most in line with where we're at in terms of the state of the word. And while all the other novels have something that is obviously relatable in a way or another, or something that is um, worth noting, uh, this book definitely has something that makes you open your eyes a little bit more when it comes to the concept of race and when it comes to the concept of mental health. And I think mental health and race are something that we have been discussing more in, pr in the present time, over the past year, and I think this is probably what is going to make this book um, winner of the International Booker Prize for 2021. Like, this could have been an interesting one. Um, I think, especially in the time that we're living through, through this COVID pandemic, the concept of being a worker and having a workplace is quite interesting, but I think it's a little bit too experimental potentially for the International Booker winner. Whereas I think um, A Night of Blood is Black is a more accessible read for everyone. And yeah, a very good book, a very solid book. So yeah, this was my prediction for the 2021 International Booker Prize. I, as I said, I am not an expert, I am not a book critic, nothing of such. I'm just somebody who likes to read and enjoys just making videos and talking about books. So this were my two cents on the International Booker Prize shortlist for 2021. I hope I didn't offend anyone. If I did, I apologize. Uh, the fact that I personally didn't like some of these books doesn't mean that they are bad books, not at all. And the fact that they are on the shortlist clearly says the opposite. Thank you so much for watching. Do let me know what your thoughts are on the shortlist or on the winner. Uh, because I would love to hear them and I would love to have a little civil discussion in the comment section. But yeah, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Watching me rant about books and talk about books probably really poorly because I'm quite tired and I'm really, really warm because I have to close the windows. But um, thank you for your time. And this was my prediction for the 2021 International Booker Prize winner. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, click the like button and leave a comment because that really helps. Thank you. Goodbye.